being here. Um, my name is Tim Shearer. I'm the AUL for Digital Strategies and IT at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, and I've been part of the uh, Fedora world for, gosh, since probably 2008, uh, where we started to use it for our repository systems. I've been on governance for a while, and I'm currently the chair. And I'm here to talk about uh, Fedora, specifically about Fedora 6, but also about some of the work we've been doing to tap into the community and do strategic planning as well. Um, we just announced the 6.2 release candidates available, and there'll be information about that at the backside if you're interested. Um, I wanted to let you know that I'm going to talk about four things. So Tim's version of what is Fedora, a little bit about Fedora 6 and where we are today, um, something about called OCFL, which most of you probably know about, but the Oxford Common File Layout. Um, and then it takes a village, which is a tool for figuring out how to do strategic planning. I wanted to give acknowledgments to Aaron Griffiths, who's the program, program manager for um, Fedora and a lyricist employee for this presentation. And I'll say all gross generalizations, mixed metaphors and errors are mine. Everything that's good in here uh, belongs to her. All right, without further ado. Um, this gets into Tim's uh, a very short history, an editorialized version of, of Fedora. So my observation is that almost all repository systems are, are attached to their, their beginnings. So for example, Content DM was really about a picture and some metadata. In some ways, DSpace was about a PDF and some metadata. There are repositories that are about data sets and metadata or monographs and metadata. Um, Fedora is also tied to its past, but it started really as a theoretical approach to how one would build a preservation repository. So it's deeply rooted in its theory uh, and it's it still holds many of those sort of progenitor pieces in its in its uh, in its system. And I just wanted to mention that. So uh, what happened is a group of people thought, how are we going to build a preservation uh, repository system? And they did. And it became called Fedora. And it went through versions one, two, and, and three. In three, I think it really stabilized. It became a part of a lot of preservation uh, programs at institutions globally. And probably that's where the greatest um, install base happened, uh, was at Fedora 3. And when it got there, it was really great um, at being modular, agnostic, um, and, open, and, and open. So by modular, what I mean is that uh, you can put pieces together and build your own. It's not unlike Lego. Um, the problem with Lego is you have to have a plan or figure out how you're going to build things. It's agnostic in the sense that it doesn't care what um, objects go in it. You can put a PDF in it. You can put a movie in it. You can put a data set in it. It's also agnostic about how you describe those things. So you can choose whatever controlled vocabulary or um, or metadata models you wish. And it's also agnostic about how the relationships between those things are built. So instead of having a, a thesis that's a PDF, you can have a thesis that's a PDF that has two video files and three spreadsheets. And you can build the, the, the thesis as the aggregate of those objects. And Fedora supports that. It's also part of a preservation program when it was in version three, it was a very Fedora specific thing, but essentially what you wrote down to disk is something a human being could read and, and you could literally rebuild an entire repository from disk. And a lot of people saw that as a great way to think about um, forestalling against risk and um, ensuring that your repository would last no matter what. For instance, if you had a corrupt database, it didn't matter, you could rebuild from disk. So that's Tim's unauthorized version of, of, of Fedora. Um, with Fedora 4, there was a move in the community to try some really cool and interesting and good things. One of them was to start to explore linked data really heavily, and it kind of moved us from an XML model to a triple store model. Another thing that uh, was a great idea was to begin not building tools that already existed, but rather bringing those tools into Fedora, into the Fedora stack. The net result, though, was that for the community, it was sometimes really hard to get from three to four because your whole way of doing business had changed. And unfortunately, at least one of the tools that we integrated into the stack 
caused real performance and stability issues. And so anyhow, Fedora 4 came with some challenges, um, both for people who had adopted and people who were trying to get there. So uh, one of the cool things that also happened, though, was this idea of moving towards a published Fedora API. So you could worry less about Fedora as something you had to understand, but rather something you could just interact with um, in persistent ways. Um, at the time, a deliberate decision was taken to move to five and then to six to get us back to something that was performant, scalable, um, and closer to the original um, version of Fedora 3, which, which people loved. So that's a little bit about uh, what Fedora is. I want to say Fedora is also a community that I'm a part of and I love, and that includes um, people who are strategic, people who are thinking about theory and practice, people who are writing code. Um, and some of the folks that use us are academic institutions and universities, cultural heritage organizations, research institutions, libraries, and government agencies. We're made of members. All right. You can think about Fedora in the context uh, uh, maybe of Sembera as being middleware. It can sit in the stack and manage essentially the ingest and relationships and management of objects and their metadata and their relationships and not have to worry about that piece. Um, so the interface and discovery layers might be up here and then there's uh, Fedora in the middle doing the object management relationship mapping. And then there's some sort of storage under, under the hood. Um, one of the things that Fedora can suffer from is people don't even sometimes know that it's a major part of their system. Um, there's three main ways that people use uh, Fedora as part of Samvera, where it's an option, as part of Islandora, where it's an option, and some people, including the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, use it as a standalone. We built so many tools around archival support or archivist support that we have our role our own Fedora in addition to a Hyrax repository. All right, so what does Fedora 6 offer? Well, we, we took the lessons from three, we doubled down on them. So it, it really is thinking uh, a lot about how um, your preservation program works and trying to be an integral part of digital preservation. Um, it is, we've found it to be robust, performant, and then it scales. We've uh, removed some of the tools <laughs> that were causing problems. And uh, we did a lot of work to make sure that it is doing its own thing. One of the examples of a tool that we got rid of was Modeshape. Um, it's a, uh, increasingly turnkey. It is much easier to uh, pop out of Fedora instance without having to know 50 million things and have a team of 12 people. Um, so it's increasingly turnkey. Because it does so much abstraction um, and it has a published uh, API, it supports integrations. So with other systems, just pass it to me, I'll pass it back. And migrations, it's easier to pass things forward. Um, and it provides end uses standards. So as I mentioned, there's the published Fedora API spec, but it also leverages uh, uh, REST um, for in, uh, standard web API access, linked data, access control, and versioning and messaging. Um, and those are all, um, we think really good things about it. All right. Um, one of the things that we did as part of this um, move to get back to digital preservation program support was to adopt OCFL, which was burgeoning at the time. In my mind, OCFL is kind of um, an, ag again, agnostic, non-specific um, attempt, not attempt, realization of what Fedora 3 used to do by publishing XML down to the file system uh, in ways that were parsable. Um, and so we've adopted uh, as part of Fedora 6 OCFL. Um, I wanna give props and um, people on the call may want to add to the chat other folks who, who re deserve credit for this, but the editorial board of OCFL has included Andrew Hankinson and currently also uh, from the Bodleian and currently has Neil Jeffries from the Bodleian, Rosalind Metz from Emory, Julian Morley from Stanford, Simeon Warner from Cornell and Andrew Woods from Harvard. And I think the community owes them <laughs> a debt of gratitude. I also wanna mention Peter Winkles uh, for his work as well. So what does OCL, OCLFL offer? Well, it offers an abstraction between the repository management system and the storage under the hood. It produces parsable uh, structured data that a human being could literally read if it was uh, printed out 
um, and, and understand what the repository was, what the objects in them were. It offers robustness, there's checksums, and all the things that you would hope for to mitigate against risk of data loss, data rot, um, something inadvertent happening, being able to get back. It offers versioning, and it offers a really elegant version of, uh, version of versioning in that um, every change that happens can be trapped, but you only have to trap the diff. You only have to trap the part that changed. So for instance, if you had a PDF that never changed, but you changed the author, uh, I don't know, the school's name changed, those changes are trapped um, and you can walk forwards and backwards, but you don't have to rewrite the, the PDF file. It offers storage diversity because it's agnostic. It doesn't care what you put under the hood, including um, a networked file system, an attached file system, or cloud. And it's complete. It's a whole package. You should be able to recreate your repository literally from OCFL. It's a super cool thing. If you don't know it, I hope you'll check it out. Um, all right, some additional features that I want to mention about Fedora 6. Um, we've put in performance monitoring, and this actually in some ways is a byproduct of making sure that it would scale. We wanted to know when we were building the system how it was doing, and so now um, people can benefit from the performance monitoring. Um, people also asked for simple search. They just wanted to be able to peek around and see what was in the repository. That's been added. And there's a whole huge effort uh, supported in part by an IMLS grant to look at version of uh, version migrations. Um, we specifically built six to be a whole lot more like three so that if people wanted to, they could skip directly from three to six. There's tools that help you do the migration. Um, so far, the evidence is they're working pretty well for folks. I know that all migrations are local. Uh, the decisions you've made about data modeling, metadata and objects are yours. But what we've tried to do is get rid of some of the technical debt and the, the pain of, of uh, migrations. At this point, I wanted to mention Seth Shaw at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where they have an Islandora um, set up. He's done a really nifty write-up of a migration that he did using the tooling. Um, I've asked him if, if this is accurate and he said, yes. More or less, the major amount of time that was spent on the project was waiting for the system to grind through data. The major hiccups were three sort of semi-hidden embedded configurations. And first, uh, the first cut was not throwing enough hardware at it using a dev server. But it is a true success story. And I'm super excited about it. And you can read about it. Um, all right. So I wanted to talk also about another uh, suite of tools that have come along with six is the camel toolbox. It's a really nifty suite of microservices based on Apache camel that lets you um, have a persistent way to talk out um, via HTTP to things. Um, so you can basically post things out to solar or a triple store. You can do fixity checking, you can do auditing and basically call any HTTP endpoint. It's pretty nifty. Um, all right, so I've talked a lot about Fedora, what it is, or Tim's version at least of what it is, and Fedora 6, what, what it's offering now. And I wanted to switch to um, specifically Fedora 6. So we hit our milestone last summer. I wanted to give a shout out to Lyricis as an organizational home for that. There were, as some of you may know, um, some changes in staffing. There were some economic downturns that uh, were a byproduct of the pandemic. And Fedora helped keep the staffing and the economics stable so that we could meet our deadline, and we did. Fedora 6 was released last summer and um, seems to be working great. So um, the question is kind of what, what do we do now? There's been this huge push to kind of take what happened between three and four and get back to where we think it should be, and it is there. So what do we do now? Well, the Fedora Governance and Lyricist Partnership have, have done some work around information gathering sessions. So what we did is we reached out to the community and just said, hey, we'd like to talk to you not just about Fedora, but about your repository programs. And those were really fruitful. And actually, they were really rewarding. Um, what we were hearing from the community was Fedora 6 is what they want and need. In fact, part of why they wanted is Fedora 3 was stable. Everyone was saying Fedora 3 just works. It's the only part of my repository stack I don't have to think about. And Fedora 6 holds the promise of, um, of basically filling that niche. Um, so that was great. 
We also wanted to make sure that we weren't dropping the ball and saying, well, six is done. So there was a community technology survey done. And thanks to the folks that participated in that, and that generated some, some new features. Um, there's open weekly tech meetings where folks can come and talk. And then at governance, we built a couple of teams to look at uh, strategic planning. And this gets me to my third, my fourth thing. So I did Fedora, what is it? Fedora 6, where are we? Uh, OCFL, and now I wanna talk about It Takes a Village. So um, what we did is we got together in January and we built uh, some groups to start uh, thinking about how we could do strategic planning for where do we take Fedora and the program in the community next. And fortuitously, um, uh, there's a, a tool called um, It Takes a Village. And I wanna also give a shout out to Lori Arp from Lyricis and Megan Forbes, who's the program manager at Collection Space who are the architects and sort of the, the leads on It Takes a Village. But It Takes a Village is kind of a toolkit and a framework to think about how you would do strategic planning, how to figure out how to make your open source project sustainable. Um, and it's lovely, <laughs> it's vetted, it takes you through steps that you don't have to think up on your own, you don't drop balls and it's easy to engage with. So anyhow, with the help of lyricists, and I also want to give a, a shout out to Heather, uh, Heather Greer Klein for helping moderate some of these, we've begun this process of engaging with It Takes a Village. Um, there are four parts to It Takes a Village. Um, there's technology, there's governance, there's resources, and there's community engagement. And uh, what we wanted to do was start with uh, what should we focus on? So we gave a pre-work assessment to all the participants on all four of the aspects. And then looking at the results of the, the pre-work assessment, we found that the two areas that people had the most to say about and the most uh, potential for digging in were community engagement and resources. Um, so that was based on our, our, our ranked series of statements. What's really great about It Takes a Village is then having chosen what you wanna focus on, there's a series of activities you can do based on what you've decided is most important and those activities then lead to action items. So we've been working as a group, uh, as, a, as a group to, to do those exercises, identify those areas and then move on those. And we're partway through that. What we hope to do is come up with a series of action items and then move forward on those, which will be project planning. Um, some steps and lessons learned. Um, collaboration is huge. Uh, broadening your, uh, your view, widening the angle of your lens to bring in more voices. Uh, we were deliberately trying to bring in folks who are repository managers and not just technologists or leaders to make sure that we were getting folks globally who might have different perspectives on, for instance, privacy of uh, Europe. Um, so broadening that lens and collaborating. Um, lean on the tool to mitigate bias. We were absolutely sure the two things we we're gonna look at were resourcing, so think dollars and people and brains and software developers and technology. And it turns out that we did stick with um, resources, but we added community and, and not technology um, for where we wanted to bring our focus. So lean on the tools. Um, and as I said, bring in voices from different areas. Um, and this is the requisite slide to thank people who support Fedora. These are folks who provide uh, funding and brains and leadership and governance and code uh, to Fedora and we're grateful for them. And then I just wanted to leave you with a slide uh, that has some of the links. So you can download the latest, the current version of Fedora, the latest uh, release as well. Um, you can learn more about It Takes a Village. Uh, we have a wiki where lots of things are documented. I really want to give a shout out to the Slack channel. Um, there's Slack uh, for Fedora broadly. There's a tech channel. And I really wanted to highlight that there's a migration channel where there's a lot of cool activity about migrations. You can join our community uh, mailing list. You can follow along on YouTube and subscribe to the newsletter. And Aaron would kill me if I didn't say, and you can become a member. Uh, we are always looking for people to help strengthen Fedora and how it fits into the broader ecosystem and how it meets the needs of the community. And with that, I will say thanks and leave you with Erin Griffin's name. Uh, you should feel free to reach out to her or to me. Um, 
for anything you'd like to discuss. And with that, I will stop sharing and open it up. Thank you, Tim. Um, that did um, fill out our morning time slot. So uh, if there are any questions, I'm sure Tim would be happy to follow up in Slack. Yep. Um, I will be back here um, on the hour. So we'll take a 10 minute break and I'll see you all in just a few. Thanks everybody.
All right, welcome back. Um, we'll get started in just a second. I hope everybody refilled their coffee. I know I did. And we'll have some interest in working group updates. Uh, I think first up is Anna Gosselin with the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. You ready, Anna? Yes, thank you. Um, all right, uh, so um, I am Anna Goslin and I'm from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, I am one of the co-facilitators of the St. Vera Metadata Interest Group, along with Nora Zimmerman from Lafayette College. And I'm just going to be giving a very brief update today on SIG for anyone who's interested in getting involved or any newcomers to the community. Um, SMIG meets on the fourth Tuesday of the month from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern via Zoom. And our calls usually average about 10 to 15 participants. Uh, our next meeting is on Tuesday, May 24th, and we can be found on Slack and St. Bernard's metadata channel. Our wiki includes information about the group's current activities and meeting information with notes and connection instructions. In January of this past of this year, we uh, held a roundtable discussion on metadata for diversity, equity, and inclusion, where participants from several institutions shared their work on harmful language and content statements, as well as reporting workflows. So thank you to everyone who participated in that discussion. The notes are available on the wiki, and we hope to uh, hold more discussions later this year on additional topics. Um, SNCC's goals include identifying models that may help community newcomers, providing support and a place to ask questions, and providing ways to share work. So we hope that you'll consider joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. I think uh, next we have Chris R. from University of Hall. Are you ready, Chris? Uh, yes. Just. Share my slide. Okay, so I hope you can see that. Uh, so welcome to a brief update from the Sambira Marketing Working Group uh, and what we've been doing recently. So um, as Anna has just done, a quick recap on the Marketing Working Group itself. Uh, we meet uh, every fortnight uh, at 11.30 Eastern time uh, on Wednesdays. Uh, so the next meeting is on May the 18th, if you'd like to join us. Uh, we have a Slack channel, uh, which we use, and we also have a wiki space, uh, which gives you a record of the meetings that we hold and also has some resources on it. For example, um, a, a Sambira leaflet and also um, the, well, the Google Slides uh, templates uh, and a couple of other things as well. And I'd like to give out a big thanks to the members of the group, Karen, Heather, Nabila, Alicia, and Charlotte, uh, for all the uh, help that they provide in informing our discussions around how we can market Sambira uh, in different ways going forward. Um, a couple of things to flag up uh, to people. Uh, one is that uh, we're back into conference season. Uh, so Sambira and before it Hydra had a long record of um, supporting, sponsoring uh, if conferences that are relevant to uh, the community and which members of the community attend uh, fairly regularly. Um, that sort of got put on hold, of course, to some extent when during uh, COVID and the pandemic because uh, the events weren't being held in quite the same way, although we were still able to sponsor some of their online equivalents uh, in um, to some extent. Uh, looking to the next uh, couple of months, just to highlight for those people who may be attending either of these conferences or know people who are, that we are sponsoring Code for Lib uh, at the end of May. Um, uh, and we are also sponsoring the Open Repositories Conference, which is taking place in the first week of June in Denver. Um, that so Code for Lib is uh, we're, we're sponsoring it. The logos on the website it will be highlighted as being one of the sponsors. Uh, beyond that, um, we're not actively in, involved uh, on the ground, so to speak, because it is an in-person conference. At Open Repositories, there will, however, be a table, 
uh, and an opportunity to uh, meet uh, fellow Samverans and those interested in Samvera at the conference as was uh, through that table. Uh, so please, if you are attending, then uh, do um, uh, pop along, come along, uh, join in the conversation, uh, meet other people. Uh, it would be a great opportunity to see each other face to face in a way that many of us haven't been able to do so for the last um, year or two. Um, we're also very keen as a marketing group just to understand what presentations people are looking to put together for these two conferences, but also for other conferences as well. It's always useful for us to be aware of where um, Samvera is being talked about, which communities it's being communicated to, what work is being communicated. Uh, so if you uh, are able to, then please do share via our Slack channel um, what you're presenting on. Uh, so, and then we can drum up some interest and also it's useful for us to be able to showcase um, what is being presented. We also have, what I haven't put there is, but we also have a Samvera repository. Uh, so if you are giving a talk about Samvera, then please do consider adding it to the repository because then it adds to the list of resources that we have as a community uh, to help inform our own thinking, but also to help showcase what Samvera is and can be for others um, wanting to know more about it. Um, and regarding the table at Open Repositories, uh, come along joining the chat. If you're also willing to help uh, volunteer to uh, staff the table uh, at some point during the conference in order to act as that sort of focal point, uh, then please do um, uh, let us know. It'd be very helpful indeed. Um, one of the other pieces of work that we're taking forward currently is to, I suppose, look at a bit more at how we capture how we as institutions are using Sambira and to share that. Uh, I think one of the things that we found when we put together the Sambira tour, uh, the online tour around Sambira sites that you can find on the Sambira website last year, is that the variety of different types of institution and variety of different types of repository is quite wide. Uh, um, and to that extent, it would be great to be able to capture a bit more of the information about how different institutions have engaged with Sambira. Uh, we have a brief template there, uh, which is uh, typically Google very unfriendly to remember, but of course it will be in these slides, uh, which will be shared um, through this uh, events wiki page. Um, if you're in a position where you can actually um, complete one of those templates for your institution and your work with Sambira, that'd be fantastic. Uh, and please then send it on to uh, the Sambira uh, marketing website uh, group, uh, Slack channel, um, or to any one of the members if you'd like to share it and get some. Uh, peer review and support. Um, the more we can share about what Sambira can do, the more we can share about the richness of what Sambira can do, then the uh, more conversations we can have with people who would like to be part of our community and help them understand others who may be in the same position as them in terms of being able to take those steps forward in using what we can offer. Uh, but that's otherwise, thank you very much. Um, if there's any direct questions, then happy to take them either through email or the Slack channel. We are making good time on this. So if anybody has any questions for Chris now, we could probably take them. I'm very excited that Sambera will be uh, at Open Repositories, so I look forward to seeing uh, some of you there. As will our full collection of hex stickers. So if you're short of any of those, then please come along, pick some up. We do have a question, Chris. Is there a preset template to explain Sambera to Open Repositories? Oh, I see what you mean. So I mean a slide that people can include in their presentations, I guess. Is that what's yes. implied? Yes. That is what um, implied. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, there isn't a current one, but we can certainly put one together for people and share it, certainly, yes. Um, so yeah, thanks for the suggestion. We'll get that out as uh, in due course. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, I, we can move along and we'll have an update from Heather Greer Klein. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm just giving up the on the Zimvera Developer Onboarding Working Group. So this working group has met about four times. We meet uh, roughly every two weeks, and our next meeting is on June 1st. 
So multiple teams have gone through the challenges of onboarding developers and this working group is working to draw on those efforts to create a body of resources for this task. So our objective is to create, update, and organize documentation guides and other resources that will help Samvera development teams to onboard a developer who has no Samvera experience. So we're also creating plans to ensure that this documentation can stay up to date through regular reviews and updates. Uh, we're taking a multi-phase approach. So we're starting with an inventory of existing Hyrax and Valkyrie documentation and resources. That seems to be the biggest area of interest in the community. And we're using that inventory to make updates and to organize the documentation, find ways to make it easy for new developers to find all of the onboarding resources they need. Uh, in, they may not all be in one place, but we want them to be able to, to find them together. Uh, we've got future phases that are gonna focus on creating and updating uh, resources for Hyrax. Once the Valkyrie integration is complete, there's gonna be a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of updates needed to Hyrax documentation. So we're preparing for that now, uh, including there's going to need to be new workshop and tutorial curriculum. So we're gonna work with others in the community to get all of that up to date. And we're looking for opportunities along the way to templatize and standardize how the community um, puts these resources in place across all Samvera technologies. We have a fantastic group of people engaged in this work. We've actually just added one new member uh, in the last half hour. So feel free to reach out. More members are always welcome, especially if you have faced the challenge of developer onboarding. Uh, we have developers in this group and, and would love to have any others who have taken on this task in the past. And also developers who are newer to the community to help in identifying pain points and places where um, further documentation is needed and, and other kinds of materials are needed. So feel free to join us. Thank you, Heather. Um, and we can uh, move along with uh, John Cameron, who's got an update on the roadmaps alignment group. Hello, uh, oops. I'm John Cameron, and I'm here to give uh, updates on the roadmaps alignment group. Um, so the roadmaps alignment group, um, you know, basically is sort of like uh, meant to be a group that comes across from many different areas um, in concerns of Sam Vera. Um, sort of got our, our charter here in very short form. Um, but essentially, it's to try to get collaboration going, um, make sure that we're on the same page and coordinate road mapping. Um, so you can see the current member selection, um, you know, we Basically, part of the group is trying to make sure that this wide um, sort of uh, a set of people with um, interests in different parts of San Vera are represented here um, with Heather, you know, basically serving as the focal point as community manager. Um, so our activities um, over uh, the past, um, you know, a few months or uh, so since um, our last connect. Um, we've been talking about the staffing needs um, assessment, which was a document that was just to help um, sort of foster some of the discussion around the Hyrex tech lead position. Um, so shout out Nabila and some others who, who helped with that. Um, but basically, you know, talking about that position, um, you know, thinking about uh, what people wanted in the community. Um, and then thinking about Samvera maintenance issues. So we do have um, a table, you know, that's specifically just for maintenance issues. And right now it sort of looks like you'd expect um, with, you know, rails and bootstrap um, upgrades and blacklight. Um, but, you know, really we've just been discussing a lot of things that have come up in the community. Maintenance is a big one. Um, other community issues, particularly things um, about uh, code that we want to encourage people to share, um, code with reclamation projects and working with the core component uh, maintenance working group. Um, and then talking about the Hyrax roadmap too, we've been talking a lot about um, Hyrax, Valkyrie work, um, and the ultimate product owner transition um, since Julie will be moving out of that. Um, and, you know, we'd like to basically um, be a part of uh, that process as it goes along. 
Um, so something upcoming pretty recently um, or pretty soon is GitHub Teams. So we have uh, the ability to do all these neat things in GitHub in our organization um, with Teams. And so the Roadmap uh, Alignment Council is uh, proposing a review and audit for the upcoming Developer Congress. Um, so we would love if you're interested to join us on that. Um, you know, basically community review of all these teams, you know, making sure that it's really easy to add or remove people, um, set up groups to do various permissions, you know, clarifying who has access to what, who wants to publish this or that, um, just sort of uh, getting some of those things ironed out. Um, and I also want to bring up the roadmaps alignment space. So this was just a page um, that, again, is a, a table of um, features, concerns, other things that are pe uh, people are working on. Um, sort of across projects and across institutions. Um, and it hasn't been updated too recently, um, but I just like to take you know this moment to encourage people to um, take a look at that and, and update for you know your projects um, as necessary if you haven't looked at it in a while, just so that we can always sort of keep up to date on what people are working on. Um, so things that are next, uh, creation of a communications plan for predictable uh, technical work. Um, I think a lot of the things that we end up discussing, you know, are like, you know, what are the pain points or, or what's sort of like the current uh, focus? And I think, you know, basically maintenance um, is something that everyone is concerned about right now. Um, so, you know, trying to make scheduling that more routine so it's, it's so it's an easier process for everybody, um, you know, whether yearly or some other schedule. So that's something we're going to be talking about with the community soon, um, as well as, you know, new Hyrax product owner. Um, you know, getting somebody in that position so that we can help work with them, uh, Julie can work with them and sort of help shepherd that process along um, in any way we can. And then just reviewing the group charter um, for this group to make sure that, you know, we're still on the same track um, that we want to be, uh, you know, anything that we want to accomplish is laid out there, um, you know, just sort of a general review of that. So thank you. So um, yeah, the Roadmaps Alignment Group um, you know, has a page on the wiki. You can check out our meeting notes. Um, and other things going on. And then uh, there's a Slack channel that's also public. So if you have anything you know you want to um, send to the Roadmaps Alignment Group, please do. All right, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I just want to point out that Heather shared some material in uh, the Connect channel in Slack in response to the request for marketing materials about uh, sharing out um, Sanvera information. And we are running about two minutes ahead. So if anybody has any Q&A uh, related to the updates that we just had, I'm sure that uh, folks would be happy to respond. While we um, kind of see if anybody has questions, I will just go ahead and introduce the next folks to make sure that they're lined up and ready to go, even though we might be a couple minutes or two early. Um, we are going to hear about the Schooly Gem for Google Scholar Indexing from Jody Bailey and Rachel Lynn at Data Curation Experts and Emily Porter at M uh, Emory University. And um, I don't see um, any questions. So uh, is your group ready to uh, kick us off with the next talk? Yes, I think so. All awesome, right. Jody. Go ahead and screen share if you're able. So Emily is going to share our slide deck. And okay. I think that is working. Yes, I, I see it. So I hope everyone else does. Looks good. Um, yeah. Great, thanks. So thank you for attending our talk about the story of the new Schooly gem for Google Scholar indexing. I am Jody Bailey with Emory University, and I'm joined today by my Emory colleague, Emily Porter, and our external partner, Rachel Lynn, with Data Curation Experts. Please note that if you have any questions, um, some folks from the DCE team are on Slack and would be happy to help you or ha help you to answer your questions. So our story, um, you can go ahead and yep, yeah, thanks. Our story has three major players. Um, so my office, the Scholarly Communications Office provides public facing support for our theses and dissertations repository, which we'll refer to as ETDs. 
including helping users with deposits, extending embargoes, and other general questions. Our colleagues in library technology and digital strategies, represented today by Emily Porter, work closely with my office to provide tech support, and they serve as a connection between my office and DCE. Rachel Lynn represents DCE today, and we have a collaborative vendor relationship with them. They developed our Hyrax-based ETD platform and now provide hosting and maintenance services. So a little bit of background. In spring of 2021, the Scholarly Communications Office was contacted by an Emory PhD alumna who was puzzled because she could not find her dissertation using Google Scholar. I was also puzzled. So I did some digging and found that Google Scholar not only did not index that particular alumna's dissertation, it didn't index any of our theses and dissertations. I later discovered that this was a known gap within the Sambara community. I asked my LTDS colleagues whether work could be done to fill this gap so that Google Scholar would index our ETDs, but was told it would be outside the scope of our maintenance contract with DCE. However, somehow, somewhere in a very lean budget year, Rosalind Metz later found some funding and LTDS and DCE entered into an agreement to do development work, ensuring that Google Scholar would index our theses and dissertations. Emily will continue our story from here. Thank you, Jody. Uh, as Jody mentioned, I'm part of the library uh, technology division. Um, and in addition to work we do with DCE and scholarly communications regarding um, ETDs specifically, we also develop and maintain a local Semvera infrastructure that we've been building over the last few years. So when we were talking with DCE about how to scope this particular piece of you know, this project work, we wanted to make sure that we could use it for other scholarly collections um, that we have in our, in our environment. Um, and we also wanted to build it in a way that we could share it back out to the community if possible. So you can kind of see a little bird's eye view of our uh, Samvera infrastructure here at home. Um, but you can see that while we do use Hyrax, uh, we're primarily using it for um, administrative and deposit functions only. And we are funneling um, our front end discovery and access through a blacklight application, which is not Hyrax. Um, and ultimately we want that to be the access point for all of our repository material um, for the public. Um, so we're aware of the fact that because we want to blend that discovery of different types of material, whether it's scholarly or cultural heritage, we may run into some challenges with Google Scholar not index indexing us um, because of that. Um, so that's probably a long term problem for us to solve, but um, we'd love to hear from others if you're working on that, too. And now I'm going to hand it over to Rachel. Yeah. Um, so thank you both. Um, so uh, in 2021, Rosalind Metz asked us to scope the work for the general purpose gem to support Google Scholarship, uh, Google Scholar integration with um, any Hyrax based scholarly repository, and then to implement the gem into their uh, ETD repository. So we ended up kicking off in February. And we started out by laying out uh, the requirements. Um, Google Scholar actually provides uh, inclusion guidelines which outline um, necessary steps to ensure their crawlers can find and accurately index scholarly works. Um, things like um, how to build a site map, um, meta tagging um, for required metadata fields, et cetera. Um, so we laid all of that out. Um, and then uh, it should be noted that, that Google really makes no promises about whether your site will be indexed or at the rate at which it'll be indexed. So, um, and as far as we could tell, we also uh, would might not, uh, they might not offer much support. So uh, just to begin with, we had to set expectations up front that the definition of done for this project might look a little different than others where the proof is, is really in the working application. For this one, as far as we knew, it could take weeks or even months um, to see the results. Um, so those expectations were set up um, early on. 
So once we had Google's requirements and recommendations mapped out, we looked at other literature as well. Um, we researched sites that were being uh, successfully indexed by Google Scholar. And we looked at specifically DSpace, Digital Commons, and um, ePrint sites for reference, specifically because uh, they were actually called out by, um, in, by Google Scholar in their inclusion guidelines. So we used them um, specifically in addition to uh, some other sites that were, were being indexed. Um, among other things, we looked at how they were implementing their sitemaps and which meta take sets they were using. The solutions we reviewed used uh, either some form of Dublin core meta tags or the high wire uh, press set tag, uh, tag sets. And um, uh, often there was a combination used. Um, and we decided um, to start with the high wire tag set um, because it just seemed like that was um, the most compatible with our examples. So um, we found out also that the sitemap could simply um, be listed, a, a list of all of the um, public access items in the repository with an update date uh, so that the crawler can uh, find any changes to once they've, um, once they've been indexed. Um, so the GEM features, um, while uh, we were asked to build the GEM uh, for hyrax based uh, repositories specifically, we actually ended up broadening that to be compatible with any blacklight based repository uh, and hyrax based. So um, that was great in that um, it made it more accessible to more people. Um, so the GEM is currently publicly available on GitHub and it's been published to Ruby Gems. Uh, it includes instructions for creating sitemap um, like we have uh, for Emory and um, customizing uh, meta metadata metadata mappings to those um, meta tags. Um, so let's see, are we, uh, can you move forward one slide? Yeah. Uh, so here um, you can see the meta tags that we used um, by going to an item page. Um, so here is an item page for uh, in the Emory um, theses and dissertations. And you can see that um, if you inspect the head element, you can see the um, meta tags and uh, how we've mapped them here for, for, Emory's, um, for Emory's site. And then the next slide shows uh, just the real simple, oh, or maybe not the next one. Yeah, so this shows our simple um, uh, sitemap. It's an XML-based sitemap. Um, and again, you can see there the last mod date is um, just helps Google Scholar um, index any um, changes. So on um, the next slide, as Jody mentioned, um, prior to launching the Google Scholar integration on production, Emory's ETDs were not being indexed directly. If at all, they were being indexed um, by other sites like PubMed or ProQuest. Um, and, you know, the goal really is to drive direct traffic directly to Emory's ETD repository, and that hadn't been happening. But we launched uh, the integration in production on April 7, and as soon as the next day, we started seeing results that was really exciting for us. So, uh, again, uh, Google makes no promises regarding the rate of indexing, um, and in fact, they set expectations real low. Um, but we have continued to see those numbers increasing um, steadily. So at the current rate, we, we have uh, about 2,000 um, indexed and out of about uh, 10,000 published ETDs. And I'm going to knock wood now, but uh, it, I think at this current rate, we might see the majority of Emory's ETDs being indexed by late this summer. So that's really exciting. Um, to note uh, some things that we've learned, um, this process actually gave us the opportunity to do some cleanup in the repository. We um, wanted to ensure that the metadata like dates were being consistently stored in the repository to ensure that they would be accurately indexed. For example, um, some earlier works in the repository had dates stored as strings um, as opposed to a, in a date format. So there was some work there to clean up um, some of that data um, to make sure that the uh, Google's crawlers were recognizing those dates. 
Um, so that's just an example, um, but it but that was a good opportunity for us to do some cleanup. Um, as Emery mentioned, too, Google Scholar doesn't index non-scholarly work. So um, while this is great for Emory ETDs, um, any application that has uh, mixed content types, there would be some uh, additional development necessary for that. Um, let's see, Google Scholar does um, provide that roadmap um, with the inclusion guideline, which is great. Um, it does not offer great support. Um, it's a bit of trial and error for us, um, and it might be for you as well. Uh, so if you run into any questions or issues, uh, having a contact at Google might be really helpful. Um, so offer to take them out to lunch and then share what you learn with the rest of us in the community. Um, so I think that is it. Um, this was a really fun project, and I want to thank Emory for um, their contribution to the community. Um, so check out the gem. Um, we have the links below, and in fact, I think Emily will show you that slide in a second. Um, but we'll provide the links for the gem, and then um, check out Emory's ETD site as well. Um, and then feel free to send us questions and any feedback. Um, that would be helpful. And I'll throw it back to you, Emily. Oh. And you're muted. Yeah, thanks everyone. And I am actually up next, so I will stop sharing and reshare. Let me quickly um, just update. I apologize for misattributing affiliations. I've updated uh, Jody Bailey and Emily Porter with Emory, um, as you will have figured out by now, and Rachel Lynn is the data curation experts. And as Emily said, um, she's up next. So we'll hear from Emily and Beth Crompton from Emory uh, about fixing up fixity checking for assets in S3. Um, and uh, Slack has been pretty active. So we'll keep on schedule and move forward. But if anybody had any questions about the last talk, I'm sure they'll be happy to respond in Slack. All right, thank you, Kevin. Make it next slide up and running. Take a breath, keep talking. Um, so I, I'm Emily Porter. I'm a digital repository program manager at the Emory Libraries, and I'm here with Beth Crompton, who's our senior operating Hi. administrator. You here, Beth? I am. Great. So um, as others have done, I want to reference rather than read in an entire and in its entirety, uh, Emory University's land acknowledgement, um, but this is included in our slide and, and there's a link to it as well. So we're gonna just kind of give a little tour of, of how we've done fixity checking um, in a couple of different ways over the last few years. Um, and to start with, this is sort of an overview of version one uh, and what we started with. Um, we launched a Hyrex 3 based curation application in 2019. Uh, it has a Fedora 4 backend, um, but we do store our files externally in S3 rather than in Fedora itself. Um, we also have a second bucket, which is a copy of the first um, as a second pr preservation copy. Um, as part of our Hyrex ingest, uh, all files that are ingested get a SHA-1 checksum, um, and that is what the Fedora Fixity service is using. And we've customized our application so that we can either kind of press a nice little button on a file set page to kick off the Fedora Fixity service for a single file set on demand. Um, but we also have the uh, ability to build up a queue and run a bulk, uh, a batch of file sets that haven't had a check in the last 60 days. Um, we also have another preservation customization where we um, store those sort of outcomes of those check events um, as little sub objects that get attached to file sets in Fedora, and they're also indexed in Solar um, so that we can do nice things like display them in the interface. Um, so there's just kind of a little truncated screenshot of what that looks like for version one. Um, and it's also tracking the version of software that was used to uh, run the check. Get the slide to advance. So version one, it works. And we were pretty happy with it. Um, it. It ticked a lot of the boxes. It did a lot of things. And it was a lot of work to get that up and running. Um, but as our uh, inventory began to grow and we we're running 
more of these kind of bulk queued checks every few months, we started to hit S3 request throttling, which led to a bunch of false failures, essentially. So we had to kind of go back and rebuild the, the service so that it would only check one SHA-1 at a time. Unfortunately, that was taking about 30 seconds or more for each file. Um, and as our inventory grew, and in fact, the last time we ran this particular um, bulk approach, it took over four weeks to complete, um, which is clearly not efficient, not going to work. Um, and just and other background processes couldn't be run at the same time because we were um, experiencing degradation across all processes. And as I noted before, we have two preservation copies of files, but Fedora only knows about one of them. So that check is only checking the first bucket. And where we are now, we're over, you know, well over half a million files in S3 times two, and that's increasing every day. So Thinking Cat had some thoughts about what to do. Um, and we needed to ask ourselves some questions like, is there a better way to do this? Can we do something in AWS itself, a, a more AWS native option? Uh, and that led us to a series of investigations, kind of trying to peek under the hood at what does Amazon actually do to ensure file integrity in S3? And, and that's a little bit of a black box, but we did find some solution papers in there that were relevant and interesting and, and gave us some insights. We also had to uh, determine what our institutions managed AWS offering would allow because we don't necessarily have access to the full service catalog. Um, we wanted to be able to check fixity for an entire bucket. We also wanted to be able to check it on a subset of files uh, as desired. We were hoping that this is something that a repository manager could run in a use user interface. Um, and then we really wondered, well, what, what would these check results actually come back looking like? And then ultimately, how much is this going to cost to run? Um, because once you start kind of layering on new tools and in this transactional model, it's really hard to tell. Um, we saw some cost examples, but they weren't really relevant to what we needed to do. So we decided to kick the tires on this and do a pilot. And now I'm going to hand it over to Beth. Hey, thank you, Emily. So AWS has some things that will make this a little easier. One of them is a state machine that just does fixity checking for you. And you can get this from a publicly available CloudFormation template. So that's lovely. Now, this state machine checks individual files. And we have an entire bucket full of a whole lot of files. So what AWS provides for us is what they call batch jobs, which are jobs that you can invoke on any subset of the bucket, including the entire bucket. And you can then take each file and send it off to a Lambda function. And what we can do in this Lambda function is then send each file off to this fixity state machine. And then the fixity state machine will tell the Lambda function, okay, did this succeed or fail? And then the Lambda function can return that success or failure on back to the batch job. And then it gets recorded automatically. And this is a little bit circuitous, but it works and it works very well, especially in our somewhat limited AWS implementation. Can you move to the next slide, please? So like I mentioned, we return the results back to the batch job and S3 batch jobs will record results for everything it does, just kind of for free and in a CSV report that ends up in another S3 bucket. And this is nice and convenient, but the format is somewhat set and there's a limited amount of things you can do with it. And it's an okay format, but it's not the best format for Emily's purposes for reasons that she'll discuss in the next slide. And I have some basic skills and delusions of grandeur, so I can make this better. What I can do is I can use AWS events to monitor my S3 buckets for the creation of these batch job reports. And when it sees one of these batch jobs getting reports getting created, it sends those off to a whole nother Lambda function, which takes in the CSV, reformats it, rewrites it to anything we want because it's just a CSV file and I know Python. 
and then it takes whatever format Emily wants at the end and it sends it off to us via just AWS SNS. And that, in a nutshell, is how we're doing all of this. Thank you. Back, to, back to you, Emily. So we're running short on time, but I'll try to get through the last few slides. Um, version two, it works and it's really fast. We are absolutely thrilled. We ran it in production on one, an entire bucket and it ran in 24 hours instead of four weeks. So it's really significant for us. Um, but there were a few things that we needed to tweak. One was now that we've changed our process, how are we going to know which file sets haven't had a fixity check since it's now kind of happening outside of our uh, Fedora infrastructure? Um, we also needed a way to kind of make sure that we could trace a SHA-1 back to its file set. Um, and we also really wanted to get the data back into Fedora since Fedora is our system of record for metadata. Um, and here you can see that nicely reformatted uh, CSV template that Beth was just describing. And this, we designed it to very closely match the structure of the preservation events that we record. So that leads us to version 2.1, round trip back to Fedora. Uh, so thanks to our software engineering team, um, we now have a task that can load that fixity data from those CSVs back into Fedora. They're indexed in solar. And we have a nice UI that allows me to go in click a button, upload the CSV, and load it back in. Um, and also, our just Hyrax users can go see those new events. You can see two rows on my screen here. One is an example of the um, Fedora report, and one is uh, an example of the serverless fixity. Um, and users can still run that on-demand on check using Fedora. So I'm thrilled about this. So additional thanks uh, to Catherine Michaelis, Brad Watson, Alex Zotoff, Devanchu Matlawala, um, for helping us get from version one, version one and version two. And Beth and I would also like to uh, thank our respective team of cats who supervise us very closely as we work from home. Uh, we have some additional notes in our slide deck, which you all can review later, but that includes information about how much it costs to run um, and also some links to some of our code. So thank you very much. Thank you, Beth and Emily. Um, here we are. Um, up next, we're going to get a component maintenance interest group update from James Griffin at Princeton. Ready, James? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen now. All right. So uh, thank you, everyone, for your time. Um, my name is James Griffin, and I am a research data infrastructure developer with the Princeton University Library. And I'm going to be um, just providing a brief set of updates regarding a newly chartered interest group, the Core Component Maintenance Interest Group. Uh, so just providing uh, some quick details regarding contact information. Um, I am serving as chair for this interest group. Uh, there are regularly scheduled meeting times weekly on Thursdays at uh, 9 Pacific um, noon uh, Eastern. Um, we are going to uh, use the Slack channel uh, component maintenance. Um, there is available uh, a, a space on the confluence and there has been a call for participation issue to the Sambaratech mailing list. Um, and we and I'm hoping that everyone who is interested and available can freely join us. Um, also, a quick note, I have scheduled the meeting time in order to ensure that everyone will be um, in the position to uh, prioritize any discussion items during the regularly scheduled uh, Sambara Tech call, which is held weekly on Wednesdays. So running through the objectives for this interest group that are scoped, um, the most immediate highly prioritized issues are going to be Ruby 3 and 3.1 support. Some of this has is underway and there are outstanding issues on um, the appropriate GitHub repositories, as well as Rails 6.1 and 7.0 support. Um, 6.1, there's some been some progress and no support for 7 as of yet. Um, we're also looking to explore possible um, extension into uh, continuous integration support. Um, there is currently a Samvera um, org for Circle CI, which is a preset um, set of configuration files. And there have been some questions regarding GitHub Actions, and we're open to these, these discussions. Um, also, it, if 
the resources are available, improvement upon documentation, uh, inline documentation using tools such as Yard or RDoc or GitHub Wiki um, uh, documentation. I'm not certain if that's gonna be realistic to expect in the near future, but if there's a demand, definitely responding to those is, is appropriate for us. Um, we would also, I would also like to propose that um, policy and guideline updates be addressed, um, possibly regularly scheduling audits for promoting components or just addressing security upgrades, say every four to six weeks or so, or um, you know, maybe longer depending upon what resources are available in terms of, of labor. Um, addressing policy uh, regarding the publishing to Ruby gems. There's, there's some inconsistency between the, the Ruby gems um, users, uh, for example, um, owners here uh, specified on the, on the page for um, hydro derivatives don't necessarily map directly to permissions that one finds on the GitHub Subvera organization. Um, and also there are some useful uh, gem security guidelines uh, regarding whether or not um, a gem can actually be uh, verified from a, a push by a trusted member of the Sunvera development teams. Um, also just general uh, GitHub organization membership restructuring, possibly um, in coordination with other working and interest groups. And again, I don't know if this is realistic for the immediate future, but perhaps accessibility and internationalization. Uh, I, I think that this might be something that's scoped for um, work beyond um, 2022 or maybe in, in late 2022 at the earliest, but just having some sort of general policy set regarding what would be aspirational might be ideal. Um, and finally, I would like to also try and uh, propose that more collaborative efforts be undertaken for component maintenance, really ensuring that our priorities will be aligned with the Hyrax maintenance working group. Um, I know that there are a number of upgrades relating to Rails and Bootstrap where uh, we should be focusing you know, labor there to assist with that efforts. I, I, those efforts, excuse me, I think that should be um, really, really given uh, full attention. Um, retaining some level of, of really regular attendance within the roadmaps alignment group. It's, those meetings have been very fruitful when I've been present. Um, and try also to assist perhaps with the onboarding working group, uh, just to ensure that the work that we're undertaking is inclusive for, for new developers uh, who might be interested in joining sprints, but may not necessarily be comfortable or familiar with the, the Sambera stack or even Ruby or Rails, uh, just ensuring that we have the, the proper measures in place to, to bring them into um, collaborative sprints. Um, further, um, uh, there is going to be a proposed scheduled summer 2022 community sprint. Um, why this has been postponed is just to ensure that any outstanding actionable items might be addressed during the next um, developer Congress. But following this, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be in the position to set some dates for at least one sprint for this summer. Um, so I have... Uh, Reserve the final slide for uh, just contact information where I, you know, I openly invite any and all um, direct messages, direct emails, or um, if one's comfortable, um, please use the component maintenance uh, Slack channel. Um, there's also options available on the mailing list. And again, please, um, for these weekly meetings on Thursdays, there's no commitment involved. There's absolutely no um, desire on my part to impose anything on attendees. If one just has questions, if one has been working with a gem and they're frustrated uh, or, or just have concerns regarding stability and maintenance, I, uh, you are very welcome. And there's no expectation that you need join the interest group to join any of these, these weekly Thursday meetings. Um, those are the updates that I have for the for the interest group. And again, I thank you for your time and do hope that uh, members of the community have, have the resources and availability to join with us. Thank you, James. Um, I love your message. I want to reiterate, don't feel like you have to be an expert or fully participate just to drop in on an interest group meeting. Um, all right, next, uh, Heather Greer Klein is going to take us home with a look to the future. Uh, moving forward together, the next six months in the Sunvera community. You ready, Heather? Yes, thanks, Kevin. One sec here. All right, there we go. 
All right. Hi again, everyone. Um, my name is Heather Greer-Klein. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the San Vera Community Manager. I have been building this presentation as we've gone over the last two days. Um, my goal is to sort of wrap up our time together with a look forward and sort of a review of the initiatives in the community between now and our next big event, which is on October, which is our in-person again, uh, San Vera Connect Conference. So I particularly want to share activities that are active and just waiting for you or your institution to join them to get them completed faster um, and to help us have input from a greater diversity of voices. So whether your institution is a longtime partner or you're here just getting to know Sam Vera, you're welcome to join any of our initiatives at any time to add some momentum to the next half of 2022. So just some things I wanted to share, some groundwork that we've laid in the first half of this year. Uh, the Sinvera board unanimously passed a proposal to eliminate the requirement that all code contributors to Sinvera Technologies and their organizations file a signed contributor license agreement. So this is a big step to making sure that contributing to Sinvera is as easy as possible that it is open to folks from around the world uh, and that there aren't any barriers to participation. So these agreements were really important in the first decade of work on the San Vera project, but there've been some changes since then that mean we no longer have to require these. So if you want to contribute to San Vera, you can just make a pull request, whether that's contributing to documentation, uh, to our website once we get it onto GitHub pages, um, if it's to code, all of that you can just go ahead and do a pull request. And anyone who is reviewing or approving pull requests, there's no need to check to make sure the contributor has a CLA on file. So that should help us going into the next bit of the year. Um, the maintenance pledge, this is our first year of having a maintenance pledge. We've got over 2000 hours of work already completed. Huge thanks to everyone who's already participated. Uh, Julie talked a lot about how much that group has helped push forward the work of uh, the Hyrax maintenance working group and also some Hyrax valkyrization work. Pledges are always open. We don't have a lot of pledges for this summer. So if you find yourself or your team has some extra time and you want to uh, contribute it to maintenance of any of the Samvera technologies, don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, we can work with you, myself and members of the Roadmaps Alignment Group to get you set up to contribute and make efficient use of your time. Uh, whether it's a one or two week sprint or you just have say 20 hours in the month of June and you wanna work on documentation, um, we would love to help you make that happen. I just wanna mention that the It Takes a Village pilot activities that were mentioned earlier uh, when Tim Shear was talking about all the good work that the Fedora community is doing, the Sam Vera board has also been participating in the It Takes a Village pilot activities. Um, we've had some great conversations. We had a fantastic partner meeting that did some of these activities earlier this week. And there's going to be more activities coming. So we are focusing on technology and resources. And there will likely be some groups um, definitely between now and the end of August and potentially at Connect. So stay tuned for more for that. But it's really helped us with some strategic thinking as we go into the next half of the year. Uh, and developer congresses. We're getting really good at these. We have at least for a year. We're making sure that whenever um, a Dev Congress ends, the next one is scheduled so that all the topics, things that folks are working on have a place to move to so they can be continued forward. This is a great time to set aside some time to contribute to the most high impact initiatives that are going on across the technologies. So I highly encourage you to take a look. The next one is the week of May 16th. And we'll have one scheduled for the summer. We'll have the dates for that uh, by the 16th. And there's going to be a one day in person Dev Congress on the Thursday of um, Connect. And a quick note that the recordings and slides from this event, they're going to be linked on the program page. I will send out an email with those links. And we've also got a post event survey to make sure that this virtual Connect 
um, is meeting your needs and to get any ideas you have for ways to make it better. So now just a quick recap from the HIRAX updates. There's a lot more detailed information on uh, Julie's slides that are linked up in the program. But just a reminder that the HIRAX maintenance working group needs more developers, really need developers through the end of the year. This group has two weeks on, two weeks off sprints. Even if you can only join one sprint, that will make a difference. It's a great maintenance pledge option. This is where the Rails 6, Blacklight 7, Bootstrap 4 upgrade efforts are happening. Um, and the next sprint overlaps with the Dev Congress. So if you'd like to make your Dev Congress contribution into two weeks, that's an easy way to do it. And the push to finish Valkyrization. I, Julie really emphasized this, but I wanted to re-emphasize it as we come out of this event. Uh, all developers can help with this. We can crush imposter syndrome. There's a place for everyone with this. Uh, between the testing and the development work that needs to be done, um, everyone can help. And finishing this is going to unlock the next chapter of Hyrax. So it's a big deal. And there's great things that are going to follow, including the Fedora 6 connector, uh, to, to point back to Tim's presentation earlier. And so again, the developer Congress, it's a great time to jump in on this. And of course, we need to grow more leaders in the Hyrax community. There's two open positions for this. Um, we need effort, not expertise. So if you're considering that, be sure to get in touch with me or with Julie, and we're happy to answer questions. Uh, haiku. There are some very cool things going on with Haiku. And uh, if you missed the presentations yesterday, I recommend you take a look. There are so many features coming in Haiku 4, the improved UI functionality. We had a whole presentation on that. And the Advancing Haiku team has finished up incredible work they've done, uh, at least 10 new features, really useful stuff. And the big ask right now for the Haiku community is the Balkrax interest group. So you can get in touch with Kevin about that. Um, I think that is going to be a great place to jump off if this is something that's interesting to you. Um, Avalon, there's some big moves coming for Avalon, moving documentation to the Samvera wiki and moving on to Hyrax and helping get Hyrax ready um, for Avalon to build onto, which is really exciting. Again, once the Valkyrization work is done, there's big other things coming. And then finally, just a few things community-wide to mention. So we heard about uh, questions about accessibility and metadata. That presentation that Julie and Anna Marie made yesterday, um, the metadata interest group will be taking that up. So you can join them to learn more. We heard from Paul about the core notify project. There's some, um, conversations that are going to start happening for that. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about it here, but we'll be talking about at a future partner meeting, um, a new idea for creating GitHub teams. And that's gonna start with some UI and UX experts who can sort of be called upon um, whenever needed in the community. We've got the developer onboarding working group um, the Samvera repository profiles, and the component maintenance interest group, which you just heard about. Um, so all of those initiatives can always use more voices if any of them were interesting to you. And then I just wanted to share, I am always here to help you connect to the community. If you're not sure, don't hesitate to ask me. Uh, you can schedule time with me if you click on my um, profile in Slack, you'll get to that link, or it's always in the signature of my email. You can email me anytime or reach out to me on Slack. And I'm going to be at um, several conferences this year. So if you're going to be there in person, I'd love to get to talk to you. And finally, at the end of six months from now, we will have Connect 2022 at the University of Notre Dame. So the call for workshops is live. Um, the first week in June, we expect registration to open and we'll have information about um, hotel block, scholarships, all the information that you need to get registered. So look for that to be coming soon. 
and the call for proposals for presentations, panels, uh, lightning talks, posters, all of that will be coming this summer as well. And the Julie Allenson Award. This will be our first year to give the Julie Allenson Award. So pretty soon there's going to be a call for a committee and also a call for nominations for that award. And we're gonna give that at Connect. So that was just a quick run through of, of what we've talked about in the last two days. And um, don't hesitate to reach out and thanks so much for, for joining us. I think this has been a great conference. Thank you, Heather. I'll leave your slide up because it's oh, oh. <laughs> your your final slide was better than the one that I, that we had in our deck. So put your slide back up there. Okay, and, I would do um, it. I just want to thank everybody on behalf of the planning committee for Virtual Connect, which is myself and Heather and uh, Amanda Foster and Veronica Robinson. Um, thanks for coming and making this another success. And as Heather said, we look forward to seeing you in October, if not before then. Have a great afternoon.